Okay, so, so uh, like I said, this is going to be a 90-minute session going from now until uh, basically uh, this is the final step of the program today for, the, for this, uh, for the conference talks. So, um, um, we are going to try and make this a little bit interactive. I mean, this is 90 minutes. It's uh, supposed to be a little bit of a workshop, so we expect to be involved as we go along. Uh, my name is uh, Ernan Mem. Yes, uh, and uh, my name is Aina Landre. And uh, we work for uh, the, the Norwegian state oil company called Statoil. Um, and, and not everyone knows that we have a very large software presence. I mean, people in the Saturn community now knows us after, after some years of, of, of participation, of course. But uh, generally, uh, even in Norway, it's not very well known that we have a very large software development department and, and do a lot of, of cool stuff, I would say. Um, so this is uh, a little bit of a, of a story and a little bit of, I mean, I, we, we have to preface this by saying this, yeah. this is still a work in progress. So we're not yeah. by any means finished with this journey, but we're going to go through the, the steps we've taken so far and the thoughts we've done and, and try to make some discussions with you guys as we go along. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's the key is that we, <clears throat> we have a definitely an identified problem we will share with you and we have some thoughts on how we think we can approach it and of course but we also acknowledge that we don't have all the answers so that's uh, why we think it's good to go to present it and okay have some discussions under the way unless yeah so in terms of what we're going to go through today um, we're going to try and describe the case of course the, our problem as it were um, and I think when you're talking about microservices, it's very, very important to go through domain-driven design. And, and uh, people do that to varying degrees. I'm going to do it more rigorously than most. So hopefully you'll know some of it and it will be new for someone and, all, and sort of repetition for some and we'll, we'll go through that. And then also a brief introduction to microservices. For those of you who weren't in Sam's talk, it's going to be very similar to what he's saying. So if you, if you know that, you can... You can nod a little bit while we do that. but um, And then the discussion part, which we plan to spend maybe uh, two-thirds of the session on, or we'll see a little bit how it goes. But uh, and, and specifically, this, this uh, what we think is part of the problem, which is data-driven versus domain-driven, uh, in terms of how we build our applications. Um, also, on the organization and team, I mean, the, the let's say the people problems of the situation which I think is very important and uh, we have some thoughts on that and also more concretely uh, finally on, on how to start tackling the monolith and breaking it apart so yeah. we should go ahead with the case <coughs> go ahead with the case yes Juju has to the point the application we're going to talk about is is a system that has been uh, with us for at least say 15 15 year in its current uh, a current uh, version. It's, uh, it's used for planning and reporting basically what takes place on such instrument as this. I'm not going, not going to learn you how to drill, but at least it's that, that this is the situation. We plan operations, they are executed and they are reported. That's basically the, the flow of work. So, <clears throat> so what the history of this system is that it started out as a simple activity log and has over in its lifespan evolved into something very, very much different. It's still the activity log there, but much, much more. It is a client server. We, we, last time we counted, it's about three and a half million lines of code. Well, the one and a half million of them are in the database. Procedures of 15,000 lines of code is not uncommon. The mother of all switch statements are not uncommon. <laughs> we have a million lines of C sharp APS.NET Silverlight code and uh, the Power Builder part, which is basically on its uh, death row at the moment. It will be terminated by end of year, roughly. So, so that's, uh, but then replaced by new code. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so if you think about what you have said, uh, these yellow boxes is basically the, uh, the domains that it, this database contains, which is then wrapped into that PLS graph. 
And we have this Windows client deployed on a Citrix system. We have we are technical, technological fragmented, and it has a lot of say what we call scripted business logic. So are the experiences so important to be listed to twice? No, <laughs> oh, did I did. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I, I talked uh, faster than. Uh, no, it's a, probably a copy paste error in the. Story. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. I have corrected several of these yeah. before, so I missed that one. <laughs> Thanks for pointing. It out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the team. The interesting part is that it's been, say, the core of this until, say, four years, four or five years ago, it was a very small team, three, three to five people. Now it's six to four. It was stuck for, it's basically one of these guys has been working on the processor of this and this in his 30 year employment in the company. So, so, it's, so, of course, you have people who are basically, their minds are carved in stone, <laughs> and the software is carved in the same stone. Legacy. <laughs> yeah, legacy people, and uh, all the type of, you can call, criticizing part, wrong part, any part of the software is taken personally. So, you, so we have a lot of, rather quite interesting, uh, say, interesting elements of psychology into this uh, equation. You said technological segregated. We are also with a new thing, working with teams in two places. And of course, we are dependent individuals, extremely dependent individuals. And of course, one of the most <laughs> dependent these is uh, approaching retirement and talking about his early retirement. <laughs> that's that's uh, what he's, and he's, we have three and a half years to go. <laughs> So that's, that's also that puts some urgency into the situation we need. And we've seen that ramping up new people on particular the database side, it's, it's not possible. People are saying, I think they've seen clever people, they, not, they don't grasp it. It's basically so much hidden in there that it takes years. And, uh, and I'm basically heading up the, the ownership of this matter the last four years. And I thought, okay, we need to at least get it, uh, get it on the right on a better track. I don't say it's on the right track, but on a better track. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so we've, we've been touching on some of these uh, already, right? Um, uh, and especially th this first one, the long lead time for new functionality, I guess this is very common to people struggling with, with these uh, monolithic systems. Um, like Einar said, the, the database model, very com convoluted. Uh, basically, there's I, I, well, if we're generous, we can say there's two and a half guys who can really do anything. But then we're really generous. It, it, it could be only one, if we, if, for some of the parts anyway, right? So, so it's very, very uh, <coughs> difficult. Um, and, and all the deployment problems, I, I, I guess you can tell from just the, the, what, what's involved here, right, with the database and... It's the, we have the database and of course, also with, with time, as we have been segregated, so IT operations has been outsourced. So we have some of this work is now, that originally was taking place at least in one geographical location, is now spread on two, Norway and India, which, me, which improves communication lines. That's we test every day. <laughs> So, so of course, and that's not, that's not something that uh, we have chosen uh, as a model, but it's it's the result of say, the idea of that I have done outsourcing of the infrastructure and parts of the, the deployment depends on the infrastructure. Yeah. Name of the game. Yeah, and also these last two two points here, uh, the technology is not really uh, modern anymore, so it's difficult to get new people in, combined with the. Uh, major parts of the team leaving in short, short time. So, uh, yeah. So as you can see, there is a nice little list here of things we need to fix quite r rather quickly. Yeah, and uh, this is basically how we we approached it, uh, or to say the idea behind was to say that yes, we have this big thing where the logic is scattered around. It's the big, the big data model, the user interface, and oops. Oh, yeah. And then try to slice it into functional verticals, services, maybe. 
and then try to build the more model the the domain models, get that crisper, and then provide some sort of APIs that you address these things and don't do everything through connection or gluing together database tables, as is the case today. So that was basically the the idea. And, and also, you know, part of the, th the things we haven't said so much about so far, but we'll come back to, of course, is this idea of ha when you have a big monolith, you're basically dealing with all problems in the same way, with the same technology and the same patterns. And as you can tell from these things, these are more dynamic than at least the reporting stuff we started with, right? So a reporting application is really geared towards uh, recording data, storing it in a database, so that architecture is fine. But when you come to something like evaluating risk or, or planning a project, then this is not the same uh, same type of, of problem, so you potentially need a different solution, which is very hard to do in this big monolith that we have. So that's one of the major uh, motivations. So uh, I promised some uh, some talk about domain-driven design. I don't know, just a quick show of hands. How many people ha know about domain-driven design? Is it okay. can if I just heard it in the last session? <laughs> sort of, yeah, no, but, but that's, uh, it's good to know anyway, because uh, this is, I mean, there are many, many facets to this, right? Um, and so um, Eric Evans wrote this book in, in back in 2003, and we, and we worked with him in, I think, 2005? Yeah, 2005. Yeah, in a, a different area, but still, we, we uh, were fortunate enough to learn uh, quite a lot from him at that point. Um, and I think along with many other people, we, we really think that many of the patterns, that the techniques and patterns he shows in this book is very important for us to be able to organize our code. And that's a, it's, it's a good model to base things on also when you now talk about microservices. And I'll, uh, we'll go through some of the, the complex, uh, some of the things there I, I think are particularly important. It's not going to be a walkthrough of the whole book, of course, but just give you an introduction to the main parts that I think are important in this uh, con context. So uh, just to frame things a little bit, this is from uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture by Fowler. Uh, so this basically places the domain model uh, as a, a pattern within the whole space of, of, uh, uh, of enterprise application architecture. So you could have sim simpler things like a transaction script, or a table module, which basically is uh, more database oriented, more um, suitable for s things like systems of record, which typically, this is a model that typically will be what you'll find in our model today, right? So what we would like is a richer model that can model the, the dynamics of the, the domain in addition to the data. So, so that's where the, the ideas from the uh, domain driven design comes in try to build a richer model, uh, avoid what, what Fowler has called the anemic domain model, which, which basically just have the data and none of the, the interaction, none of the richness of the, and the dynamics of the domain. So if, if this is an idea that resonates with you, I, I will highly recommend this book. And also um, uh, Sam in the, uh, uh, Newman pointed also to a new one that's called uh, Implementing Domain Driven Design, um, which, is, uh, which has some more examples, more concrete examples. So that's just to, to, to frame where we are. So what is the, the sort of main components of domain-driven design, right? We have, first of all, the ubiquitous language. Now this is a concept where uh, we take some concepts from the technical language that we developers speak, and, and most of the concept from the business language of our users in the business domain, uh, and we create a, a common language that we can use when we talk to, to our, our um, our end users or our, our um, uh, product owners about the design of the system. So basically we have to include some technical terms in order to explain our design, but also most for, for, uh, mostly it's important to, to sort of pick up the language that the users use. And this is a, 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 a process that evolves over time. So as the more you learn about the business domain, the more this language will, will uh, uh, sort of tend to, to, to go towards the business domain language. Uh, and that's an important thing. And, and it's important to use this 
this language when you actually name your code, name the elements of your code, be it functions or objects or, or what have you. And then there are some patterns for building this domain model we're talking about. So it's trying to simplify the building blocks. And last but n by no means least, especially in this context, is the strategic design principles and techniques. And, and that goes towards looking at the entire domain, the entire uh, business, as it were, and trying to separate out the different islands of functionality of the business context that you want to solve the problem for. And in, in terms of, of, of finding out where you have your microservices, this is crucial. Um, yeah, so we already talked about this uh, notion of having the ubiquitous language some, somewhere in between the technical language and domain language. And as I say, it tends to, over time, drift towards the right here. Uh, right, left, right, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when you're, <laughs> when you're uh, the other way around. Okay, so to your right, yeah, that's right. Um, and, and, and that has all, everything to do with your knowledge of this domain. You can imagine when you start out a project, you will start here in this end and slowly over time move towards the, the other end of the spectrum as you learn more about the domain you're trying to solve. Now, fortunately, when you start with a monolith, you will already be here for the most part because you already have the domain knowledge potentially, uh, at least if you can keep the key people if they don't retire on you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but that could be that could be uh, uh, helpful uh, when you and, and that's why often when you talk about microservices, people say it's much easier to start. For instance, yesterday when we had this microservice workshop, we say it's easier if you can start from a monolith, because then you have something to start from, right? You have some notion of design in there, at least hopefully, there will be some kind of of domain model like you can work from. Might be poor, but it's it's there all the same and, and it's a starting point. So you don't have to start from scratch. It, it can be a, a good thing. So the other part is this, this, these building blocks, these patterns. Um, I think actually <laughs> um, one of the ones that, that were added to this diagram, I think this is not in the, in the book, I think. Um, no, uh, this is basically something Eric drew up in one of our workshops. Yeah, uh, yeah. When, when, when we talked to him. So, uh, because you find this very much for us, and, and, and even though it, this was a different domain than, than what we were talking about today, it was the exact same problem. Um, and what we saw is that, you know, you encapsulate much of the logic in your database, huge amount of PLSQL code in the Oracle database, having all the business logic. So that's the anti-pattern of the smart database. Um, and also this is something we, that was there from before, the smart UI, that's the other end of the spectrum where you build a web page or whatever, where everything is in there and um, none of it is in, in the model itself. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these uh, uh, patterns here, but just to show you that there are uh, very few concepts really that, that uh, a model will consist of. So it kind of simplifies your task of building this model. And then, like I say, the, the uh, more important one for the, for the microservices part is this idea of, of, of strategic design principles. And this really goes to, to, um, towards looking at your whole business domain and how you're going to structure that business domain into manageable components. Uh, for instance, this, I mean, this can be used in many ways. We've been using this technique of, of context mapping, uh, which means basically finding out what types of business functionality, where are the boundaries between the business functions in your domain, using that to evaluate software purchases, for instance, trying to see if the software that you are going to buy fits with your identified business domains, and typically, uh, inevitably, I think invariably, <laughs> they will cross some of them. And then you have to show this and explain this to the people that are insisting on buying this and say, okay, this is gonna be a, a nightmare for you because you will only be cover, let's say, 30% of the functionality within this context, and then you have to build something on top of it to cover the rest, which can be a huge problem when you buy something that's in a, mon uh, a monolithic way, which Typically, it will be. Um, so that's one use of it. Yes? Can you 
the language piece. Yeah. How formal or not formal are you about codifying this ubiquitous language? Uh, that that really depends on the case, but I I tend to use it in the code, in the documentation to some extent. But but the code is the most important thing, and the communication. I mean, when when you typically uh, with Eric Evans, we we we're talking about these making the concrete examples that drive your uh, design. So find a, a, a situation that covers the f new functionality you want to build. Uh, use the, the language that the user uses or the, the customer uses to explain this example to you. Build it into your code and your test cases and, and drive the design from there. So typically it would be the code that maintains yeah. the language. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I want or I'll add one small thing there is that of course <clears throat> many of these domains where we have used this they are very informal by nature like drilling and also the d stuff we did within oil trading it's so 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 and I think the one of the things that we have learned is that we need to basically formalize the language but of course it's it's a question about hard we can squeeze <laughs> That's that's the key thing, but, but but I think that it pushes us toward more formalism on the language side than some of those domains have compared with more say domains you, that are more mathematically formalized in the beginning, typically engineering domains. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I guess often it's not just it's not it's not just the industry domain; it's also the company domain, right? Typically, it's, yeah. It's very yeah. sometimes it's very specific to that particular. Yeah, and, and like I say, the, the more specific the example you can use, the better. Because you want to, to code in your test the specific examples that the users use when they talk about the functionality. How many deployments of these solutions do you have exactly? How many places is the solution deployed? So we, now we're talking about... The whole thing. The whole thing. One. One, right? There's, so only, there's one. the only one, one, one implementation supports the world. Yeah. That's it. From North Dakota, no, not longer, but Gulf of Mexico to Australia. Yeah. Um, all right. Yes, but further questions? Yes? So, I hope I'm not getting ahead, but the, can you speak to migration at all? Because it sounds, when I've been in this situation, it's kind of like you got to change the wheels while the car is still moving. So, how do you migrate from a monolithic to something more service based? Yeah, uh, we, we, we still have more than an hour left, so we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's for sure part of the discussion topics later on. We'll, we'll show you some of that, yeah, for sure. Uh, at least some of the things we've done, some of the things we are thinking about, whether it's a good idea, and hence want to have some sort of uh, ping pong back, back and forth with you guys, okay? Um, yeah, so I don't think there's too much to say more about this, Otherwise, other than notice this one. This is always the one that's mentioned when people are talking about microservices. So typically, you would like a microservice to be a bounded context in your domain. Um, and, and, and the re main reason why I, I include this, or we include this big diagram is to show you where that concept fits within domain-driven design, which I don't think people are too good at doing. Uh, mostly because they only have half an hour, now we have more, so we, we can give you a bigger picture of where things fit. Right. So, a uh, little bit more about this, this context mapping exercise. So, there are some, some uh, uh, important concepts to, to get in there. And uh, uh, now, this is a, a strategic level design exercise, not a tactical level uh, design. So. That, that basically means look at the big pictures, look at the, the business functions, um, try to isolate them into contexts. Um, and in the context of domain-driven design, it's very important to, s to see that the model that's within one context, one bounded context, can be different from another, even though they contain some of the same information. So there will be relationships between objects in different uh, contexts. Um, and there are relationships between the domains, uh, which we'll, we'll come back to a little bit in the slides ahead. So this is an example from, from a, a bounded context mapping exercise that we did. Maybe you want to speak a little bit to this, Inna? Yeah, I can say a few words on it, because 
the two blue ones are basically two, two uh, the other other legacy systems, not the one we talk about here, but the one of them is basically the owner of the concept of a cargo, and the other and the rats is the owner of the of the concept of deal. That's that's how we model this. And then we had some other say information concepts that we wrapped together and tried to basically understand the dependencies between them. And uh, that was one, to say, an informal usage of this uh, type. This was done on a, some sort of intelligent whiteboard, and then we captured it. Yeah, so, and we so, show, show yeah. this just to, just to show that it doesn't have to be very fancy, it doesn't have to be very much of a big tool kind of thing. You have to draw something out, make sense, try and make sense of things. So um, notice also here that there are some relationships here between the different... Uh, contexts uh, and these are listed here from the domain driven design and not all of them are are uh, sort of uh, relevant for the microservice discussion but typically some of them will be there and and the customer supplier will be one of them conformist also the anti-corruption layer and some of these and, and also you know we're talking about the separate ways where you say one uh, uh, bounded context have its own has its own model uh, which uh, develops freely from another one. Uh, uh, and in terms of microservices, when you talk about owning your own data and, and having the separate data model, that's basically the, the main uh, focus there. Okay, uh, just uh, th those are repeated there. I don't think we'll spend more time on that. Um, but then this concept is also from the main of the sign, which uh, I haven't heard very many people speak about, but this is a picture that Inner made uh, back in 2006 or something. something. And <laughs> notice the cloud shapes around this. I mean, we are here talking about an object model within a rather monolithic site. This is way before someone has even been talking about services. We haven't been thinking about creating any type of web technology. But for some reason, he decided to put a cloud boundary around the, this object and, and when we looked at this again we, we started thinking about you know there are some rules in the main driven design uh, uh, sort of connected with this this concept of an aggregate which basically says that when you have an aggregate you have typically um, one object within it uh, that's responsible for communication with the outside world so here you can see if you're going to communicate with the product um, uh, aggregate, you need to contact the root, um, so no one can uh, can have references to other objects within the root. If you do a delete, everything has to be deleted at the same time, and there are multiple rules like that. And when you look at it, it looks uh, on the face of it like this can be the rules for a, a microservice if you read the, uh, some of the textbooks. So really, I think some of the thinking behind the aggregates. Uh, can can be um, uh, applied or, or be the same actually uh, inspiration for some of the microservice things. So that's I think a, a, a nice thing that we uh, we uh, sort, it's sort of dawned on us when we we started looking at these old slides that we had. So we're not going to dwell more on that, but s rather than go straight to the microservices portion. So if if you guys are are very familiar with microservices, this is just going to be a very quick overview of what everyone else is saying um, these days. Uh, so it's not going to be that, that new, but this is just a, an attempt to frame the rest of the discussion. So here goes. Um, so this concept of independently deployable uh, is, is important. Uh, so I'm not sure where exactly this, this uh, definition comes from, but I, it's not mine. I've found, we found it somewhere. So this, it's a way of designing software as suites of independently deployable services or components or any substitute, any word you like. I'm not particularly fond of the whole thing, but still. Um, the concept of independent deployable uh, uh, modules is important anyway. So compared to this monolithic application, you will rather have uh, multiple of these smaller components that you can deploy uh, individually, uh, and that's part of what gives you the freedom, but also the, some of the complexity in, in this whole thing. Uh, you can imagine a whole number of things related to this that's simpler to do, 
than when you deal with the situation over here, which is part of the cost-benefit discussion when you start looking into doing this thing. So, so that's just uh, uh, the, the, the kind of disclaimer that everyone does when you talk about microservices. Keep in mind this is not for all problems. It's not free by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so, so do it deliberately and, and make sure that you really need it. Um, and, and like I, I, I like the, the advice that Sam gave in, in the, the previous talk um, about just try a couple. Right? Do a couple first and then see whether you can do it. Uh, I mean, that, yeah, we'll get back to all the prerequisites that you need in order to even start, but that's uh, another thing. So again, a little bit back to this concept of independent everything, really. Right? It's, it's, uh, that's the, the lure, <laughs> let's say, of the microservice. That's that if you can uh, sort of bound off some functionality, you're able, and, and it's small enough, you're able to treat it as its own thing in every aspect. So you can have the independently building it, independent deployment, data management, data uh, storage, choice of technology if you like, right? Depends on how free your organization is. Everything like this helps a lot, potentially. Um, And then this, th there's this discussion about smart endpoints and, and dumb pipes instead of this situation which you will have frequently with, well, everyone bashes on the ESP, right? It can be, it can be good in some cases, I guess. But you know, uh, the problem is when all the logic ends up here instead of out here, then, then you're typically uh, not in the place where you want to be, uh, at least that's not going to help you independently deploy anything. <laughs> so that's at least one point about it. Um, so rather you would end up, you would like a situation like this. And, and if you've seen uh, Sam's presentations, you might rec recognize this figure slightly. But I've added some nice little brains to illustrate the point here that the logic goes there and, and not in between. And Sorry. Oh, yeah. Could you go back to that for a second? Sure. Um, so in the prior slide, uh, the, the one before this, yeah. you're saying that all the routing is done through the message bus. Yeah. And then in the next slide, you're saying that all the microservices are aware of each other. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I haven't exactly said how the routing <laughs> happens in this, uh, this uh, simplified figure, have I? But yeah, th there is some configuration involved, as there always will be. And there are a number of ways of making sure the calls end up where they should be. Uh, I mean, if, if you listen to Len Bass as well, talking about the deployment issues after, uh, before now, I he was basically saying, you can have a multiple versions of this. I mean, d d imagine you de de deploy uh, or want to deploy a new version of this service. How do you make sure that the new version gets routed to, instead of the old version, you can't take it down the, the old version and then deploy the new. You have to have them both there at the same time and at some point switch the routing over. So there is a routing mechanism in this scenario too. Okay. But just not the business logic. Right, so oh, there's, okay. a, there's a difference between routing logic and business logic. Okay. Yeah. Are you confirming that routing logic goes into ESB? Come again? A routing logic belongs with uh, the ESB. That, that's the normally the case, I think. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so just feel free to interrupt at any moment. I mean, that's that's a good thing. We have we have time, so that's good. Um, I tend to get very excited and go through everything very quickly, so it's good to stop me from that. Yeah. Can you give the argument for this because you are interconnecting the modules here, so the dependency actually becomes very explicit here instead of being yeah. independently deployable. Yeah. Now you can never deploy one piece at a time. Maybe uh, there's a dependency altogether. You mean in here? Yeah. I mean, th the whole concept of the microservice is that they are uh, loosely coupled. So, so basically, you, you will have the routing mechanism. You, you say you want uh, a service of this type. You're not, you're not saying, I want that particular IP address, right? So it's, there, is a, the, there is a concept of the loosely coupled services. Yeah. So isn't it the case that those zeros are dynamic, so that yeah. this isn't a fixed 
representation. I think you're thinking this is a fixed cluster of these microservices, but rather the way they are configured yeah. is such that there's some dynamism in where these arrows are. Yeah, go. that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. The key is that binding happens in runtime. Yeah. So when this process represented by this service need something that is owned here, it will establish the connection, do its call, get what it was after, and then the connection dis disappear again. So, so it's, uh, and that's, I think, is the reason why I talk so much about the importance of monitoring. Because you need to know what, that here connections comes and goes all the time. That's basically the, the orchestration stuff, yeah. or the chaos. You have a discovery process, basically, for each to discover the services and it, it's a, to a well, it's 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 routing. It's the, it, um, yeah. The, I mean, basically, it's it's a little bit too much to go into right now. But but there are there are a number of ways of, of doing this. But typically, it's dynamic. It's binding. It's binding. It's runtime, and and you will have like I say, you will have in in practice multiple versions of each of these, uh, potentially running at the same time, um, and and that's a that's a good thing. But also. It, this discussion, right, it touches upon part of what's what makes uh, microservice architecture hard. So, so given since it's dynamically configured, it's much harder to track errors and all of this. And and there, you know, there are many discussions on on that topic, which um, it's not really our expertise either. But but you know, the so the complexity. And the cost of doing this is, is of course, there. And, th and this discussion points to that, of course. The picture looks nice, simple, but in reality, very hard to do. So again, just make sure you really need it before you do it. Right. That's the message, I think. And, uh, so if I can just yeah. add sure. one more comment. So in SEI speak, we talk about quality attributes. And in this case, uh, quality attributes becomes paramount to be what I might call observability or monitorability. If you don't have that, there's no way of guaranteeing that those connectors are actually going to satisfy. Yeah, me. yeah. One of the important things to do here is make them observable. Uh, uh, and and again, number of open source technologies to help you do it. All right, Netflix will always be the poster child, as as they call it in the last session. But yeah, um, this will. Uh, th they have some good tools, and then of course might be can build your own, but why would you if you if you can reuse the, the, the good stuff from others? Now, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that we will come to the point where we have as many uh, uh, microservices as Netflix, right? Because we have a very different need, a uh, very different number of, of users, <coughs> um, very different type of, of system. But there are some, some areas where I think we, we can really use them and we'll come back to the motivations for going this route and, in, and occurring this cost uh, a bit later on yeah um, and so we'll, we'll skip quickly through this but this is, an, this is also an important step if you cannot provision servers if you cannot do continuous deployment as they were talking about uh, before um, before the break you really shouldn't start by splitting things out so uh, I, I think Sam's advice was good. Do the domain modeling properly. That's step one. And then you need to get your, your automation in order, the, the, the testing stuff and the infrastructure provisioning, all of that in order before you even think about separating out any services and, and doing this stuff. Because this is crucial prerequisites. Also, this is a concept of don't standardize on the service implementation, but rather standardize on the communication between them. So it's important when you talk about this to rather uh, dynamic picture of having multiple services that talk to each other, you need some kind of standard way of communicating between them so it's relatively uh, um, clear how that's going to happen. So there are a number of, of, of uh, protocols. You can use OData, JSON APIs, and Atom publishing. So, but the, the important point is just find some standard in between the services and standardize on that. And if you can, leave the technology cho choices and implementation choices within the service open to the individual teams. Now, large organizations like, like ours will probably tend to standardize on that too which is not necessarily a bad thing, 
Uh, and then you can argue for deviating on that rather than having it completely open. But there, there are degrees there you can basically play with. And then maybe coming to this, this uh, point a little late, but we have been talking about domain modeling. This is basically the, the way you find your business capabilities and, and organize your services around that. That's an important point, just to reiterate on that. And then I want to spend some time with, with, with this guy. Uh, he's been mentioned before today, I know. Um, and, and this is not the same, uh, as Len Bass pointed out, this is not the same Conway that Mary Shaw mentioned in her, uh, uh, her keynote. That's another, another guy. Um, this is Melvin Conway with this, um, uh, this law about, you know, if you, if you have the typical uh, nerdy example would be that if you have nine groups building a compiler, you will end up with a nine pass compiler. <laughs> um, and and, and in, in this, uh, um, so basically stealing a little bit from, from uh, James Lewis, um, this type of typical organization which we see in our organization where you have the database group and middleware specialist and UI specialist, you tend, up, tend to get these, this architecture. Um, and for our organization, it's even worse, maybe, because these guys are much more prevalent than these other groups, so we tend to be very heavy here because we have a very large database organization, and it's very easy to get a database and start doing stuff with a database. So that's Conway's law in, in practice. Rather than what you want to have with your agile teams, with responsibilities within the context, and then you can end up with this. And this is something that, that ThoughtWorks has, has coined the inverse Conway maneuver, which I like the term. So you can basically use Conway's law to your advantage if you want to have a more modular architecture, organize your teams first, and then it will appear magically. I don't know, but maybe not <laughs> so much. But you know, uh, the, the, at least there is, an, there is some cause and effect there which we can use to our advantage, I think. So. I think we're almost done with the introduction. Um, <laughs> You're killing people here. I know, I know. We're falling asleep down here. I know, we, we, we should <laughs> start moving to the yeah. discussion, yeah. So um, let's skip to that, but this, this thing about the DevOps culture is important. I think we have to say we, are, we, we, we don't have it. We are still working on getting that in place, so, but it, it's important to, to start on, on that level. Are you waiting for the guy to retire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, do it before. Yeah. That's uh, that's the trick. And but I think it's what we see is that of course it takes time to to change. And of course it's also a question about how you how hard you should push versus uh, the carrot and the stick. That that is the uh, the issue here. And of course here we talk about like say uh, it would be unfair to call them old donkeys, but uh, the the behavior might look like something like that. <laughs> they do what they like to do and has always done. So, so of course you have very, uh, to, to turn it the other way around, it's experienced guys who's been doing what they've been doing for many, many years and have been really, uh, and, and you can also say they haven't been successful with it. That's, uh, that's also a part of the, but until we now reach a level of complexity that we are not able to, or basically it's, uh, okay, it's threatening the system. And of course, yeah. So. Yeah, but maybe before we do here, I, I think that it, I think that if all rise up and stretch their legs and yeah. uh, do some sort of that, uh, it's uh, I see that you say, <laughs> and I know the feeling myself. And I've also been sitting and sitting and sitting and listening and listening and. Uh, we, we want to calisthenic, calisthenics. What do, what, do you, what do they call it? Uh, George had a name for this to, earlier today in the in the in the Stokes. 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 Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's the the key. So. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> It is oh. part of it, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll come back to the, the database yeah. part of it in the in yeah. the end on the this breaking the monolith part. Yeah. 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 Everyone is talking about uh, composing teams with uh, different uh, 
Yeah. 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 Now, if they are incentivized based on the team's goals now, how does that affect database standards and security and that kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no. we note down the question. I think it's that. Yeah. That's the. That's the key. I yeah. think. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind for yeah. uh, when we come to the okay. debate part. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay. What? Where? Where we are? Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically the uh, data-driven versus yes. the main. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what we were th thinking about is that <clears throat> we have this situation where. For services and modern system, we talk about that uh, domain-driven design is the best way. can argue that. But what we see is that when it comes to practice, it's what we have called the data-driven approach that dominate. We use object-oriented languages with rich possibilities for modeling, behave, behavior modeling, as scripts. And we see this uh, Java methods, I pick any language. People are still writing these 10,000 line methods. They still occur. It's, it's, it's something not something that happened 10 years ago, it's happening today. And <laughs> why, why, why? That's, uh, so, so, and then we had some sort of theories. And maybe we should share the theor our theories first and then we can uh, have some opinions. Yeah. Yeah, I think we do that. We think that when you think about data-driven thinking, comes out of the punch card. 120 years ago, in the late 1800, and uh, where they used, and basically what, what was going, taking place was, of course, enter the data, validate, sort, summarize, aggregate, do this kind of heavy data processing, COBOL, and the move operations. <laughs> That's, that's basically, and this is basically the paradigm that we have brought with us all the way using new languages. But if we then think about object-oriented languages, I had, uh, I had the opportunity to study with these guys at the University of Oslo in my, too many years ago, 30 years ago, something like that. And what, <clears throat> what when, Chris Nugor talks about the history of Simula 67, which also indicate the year it was uh, created, built on top of Algol. He said that their application was interception of and tracking of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So the need to basically encapsulate state and behavior in a modeling concept. So you can say that this is about modeling real world behavior. But what we do is data processing, and that might be one of the reasons that we have not, that basically we see what we almost can call the misuse of object-oriented languages, as long as these languages like Java, C Sharp, C++, Scala, Smalltalk, whatever, they are built for basically a different type of purpose than what we are doing in many of these systems who comes out of record keeping of whatever we want to keep track of, in this case, uh, drilling operations. And then we stick to the same paradigm and we try to add, because that's what we know. That's, that's our theory. But here we are, say, open for thoughts, views, so, ideas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't see how this leads to people writing no, that, that's another, but uh, well, that's just one of the symptoms. We see that people don't decompose problems, and uh, so it's just, there is no, there is no relationship between, uh, but I think there is a, there is a relationship, high hypothesis relationship between scripts and data processing. But uh, that could be argued. So, is uh, any of you have any Experience. I mean, several people, I sure, have monoliths. Do they have the same type of characteristics as this? I mean, the 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 God database, or is it more like you have a, a web service that contains a lot of functionality? Or I mean, interesting to hear from you guys what type of systems you see, same or different? So we basically we consult for different 
companies and uh, uh, was mostly what we observe in those kinds of uh, legacy systems is, is typically uh, quite big data, maybe not that big, like you, you have uh, so much of uh, PLC SQL code and whatever. Uh, I, I just bumped into su such kind of systems that generated HTML code out of the PL SQL, like in, in early uh, 2000, like, yeah, but now say, please don't do that, but uh, big legacy database, typically DB2 or Oracle, uh, and uh, also very monolithic, interweaved uh, uh, monolith um, web application, or which, which kind of uh, very dependent on that, uh, yeah. totally unscalable. So this kind of. Okay. Uh, I'm from Pontis, a commercial company. We have a product which is a monolith. It's not. You can only deploy the entire product, but it has 8,000 classes with average depth of inheritance of 10 levels. And a typical, uh, the average lines of code per class is less than 50 lines of code. So I claim that these are orthogonal aspects of software, whether it's monolith or pure object oriented. So are you, are you saying that you can go kind of the other way, go too far the other way, and just end up with, you know, 10 line You can be uh, very object-oriented and still be one of it. That's well, or, or still have just such complex yeah, code, so it's difficult. So, uh, yeah, so, okay, maybe it's important to, to it's note this, this goal, so the concept of uh, the monolith done right which I think is what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, right? It's, it's uh, the correct monolith, uh, maybe, or a at least better, maybe. The, the thing, the thing um, we'll come a little bit back to that, of course, but this notion of if you have a bad monolith, make it good before you break out the services if you need to, right? So this is also another thing we'll, we'll come a little bit back to. Uh, anyone else want to? Yeah, we have one. Um, I would say not a lot of the logic is in the database. I mean, there's some, but we try and move most of it, and I like it. It, it feel that it's pretty object oriented. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, there's no thousand line records. But you know, it, so, but but pretty much all of the business logic and account logic and commerce logic is, is in one app, and you know, it definitely constrains us. And you know, it's it's also in C plus plus. So you have the specialized people that are needed to work on it, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I make my living taking systems that are monolithic and service-oriented architect them, which really means you organize your architecture by services, like what you're talking about. Um, the very easiest thing you can do is integrate through data, which is what's been done most likely. Like you've got your business relationships captured through your data. You've got your um, uh, everything that happens, happens because one data gets hit and another thing triggers and another thing happens. Um, getting out of that um, is probably not trivial other than pretty much what you're doing is I, ha I want to have a certain capability that's extracted out of it and potentially tackle one capability at a time versus trying to do, lots of people make a mistake of having to do all of them yep. at the same time. Right? We're going to have this big bang. We have a party that. because we successfully microserviced. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then it blows up. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, microservices, I haven't looked into it yet. I think you also be careful of, and I don't, I, micro implies it's a lot of small services, but you want, in, in service on architecture, you want granularity. You want big Lego, Legos, little Legos. You can't build a house with a bunch of Duplos, but you can't build it with a bunch of one cell Legos either. So you don't want to get too carried away where you're really not looking at, when you say domains, and I think of service domains, it's where you have too many domains or too many services within those domains. You really have to look at what are your major capabilities, maybe relook at your functional decomposition, and a lot of times you'll find your services falling out of that. Yeah, yeah th this is uh, why we stress the, the domain-driven design aspect of it, because that's where I think, well, it's at least it's one way of getting at those business capabilities or the business uh, domains context, if you like, that, 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 that you can use to, to um, pull stuff out. 
And I would suggest one of the ways you got into this is, I mean, you have a small team with a, a, a strong domain expert. You can really rely on him. You don't have to extract things out. You know, if you had a 100-person team, you couldn't do that. You know, one person couldn't understand the whole system. You have to abstract it out by necessity. Um, and you have small teams, you know, three to five people, you're also not going to be able to take, you know, refactor the entire thing. You're going to keep kind of needing to feed into it. It's the small development, you have a new capability that you need to add to this. You, you, your, your team of three to five people is pretty well tasked with that. You don't have an opportunity to go in and just re-architect the entire thing and start off. Yep. Legacy systems were not distributed. So if we are talking about hardware systems, most likely it is going to be on the Well, I, I mean, for instance, right, I mean, a government contract, we've got a system that we've maintained for however many years, decades. But it's, it's important so the government reinvests, you know, recaps the system, and, you know, every, you know, every few years it kind of, it, it grows. So still, the, the system exists and has for a long time, but it does it much differently today. So it's definitely a monolith, but hopefully it's, it's a little more, you know, a functional monolith. Yeah. So two things I'd like to say. One is that the number of lines of code that you have has nothing to do with whether it's object-oriented or procedural. Uh, it has very much to do with the way the developer was thinking, or not thinking, most likely not thinking. Uh, the second thing is, a monolithic design sometimes is really appropriate. So for an embedded system, for instance, uh, or for a trading system that needs to be co-located to the stock exchange, for instance, you will never use a, a microservice type of thing because you, you can't afford the, late, the, the latency. Um, so I'm not saying that you know, microservice is good or bad. I'm not saying that my, the monolithic design is good or bad. But there, are, there are reasons for existence. Yeah. And, and for sure, both can be designed badly. Yes. Yeah. That's and that's, and that's, as you said, that, and I like what you said about the programmers, not because, as you say, you can, you can misuse any language. <laughs> well, I wonder if the developer, you know, writing 10,000 lines of code, or maybe it started out as 100 lines of code, and people keep making changes, and it ends up 10,000 lines. You know, but I wonder if they're making assumptions about, about goals. You know, maybe, maybe the goals about the project aren't, aren't well defined. And they're making assumptions like, oh, I have to get this fixed. You know, I have to make this change. I can't refactor the object. You know, so it's 10,000 lines. Yeah, I think it's, we have, have a bit of that. And we also see that when we have had new people and they have started to do the refactoring. So some of them we have been able to basically reduce and uh, make simpler. So, uh, so of course there is there is light in the tunnel. Also, it's not it's not pitch dark, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Okay, one more. How does the, uh, the test coverage turns out testing? I'm not sure I want to speak to that. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's if you look at the database code, there is no there is only manual yeah. testing. So we, we know it's yeah. possible to test PLSQL code uh, automatically, but I don't think anyone. You know, why yeah, yeah. You, can, you can say that the new stuff that we do, which is in, it's, it's more or less done in .NET. There we have uh, we have introduced continuous build, and we have introduced say heavily unit testing, integration testing. So that, that there is there is on track, but of course in the old say the, the database code there is uh, it's almost nothing. Yes. We'll, we'll come back to it yeah, a little bit. Okay, uh, question. I have actually quite a bit of experience on this uh, kind of embedded system with this monolithic code, and uh -huh. it's actually very prevalent. Uh, one of the ways you can actually do, and people tend to do, you know what he said, that there is some code, people don't have understanding of the ramification, so they add it at that same place. One way, could you consider like externalizing the data? So put it outside a process which automatically will actually filter out the dependencies for you, and you can come up with an access method and dependencies and mutual exclusions, things like that. Mm -hmm. It can help you stabilize the code and try to filter out things into independent modules and formalize the dependency in the code. Right. 
Okay, see, the time is moving here, but uh, okay, Dennis. Uh, how much of your existing database, which has obviously grown over time, uh, probably by a factor of 100, how much of the database and the database code is dead code? Data that nobody uses. That's, we, we are, <laughs> at the moment, we don't know, but we have introduced a lot of, say, Ta say logging and uh, analysis of that part because we need to figure see basically how much dead code is there and basically what kind of functionality is used. So that's uh, that that's in place. So probably a lot, but yeah. I have a suggestion on that. Do you know about tools called Coverity? Yeah, yeah, I know about that one. Does go Coverity work? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So uh, I basically skip skip this part because we've already spoken a lot about this, but the main point is that there are different, um, uh, like we have been mentioning already, there are different parts of the application that are more dynamic in nature, which is basically what motivates our, our uh, thoughts about taking stuff out and implementing it in a different way than we have today. So one thought here that why we're here is to use microservices in a way to do this and we'll come back to how we go about uh, attacking ac this this thing um, and yeah, I think so. So I just mentioned also that of course when we made some of these drawings with but they're not in the beginning thinking of microservices but then we said we came over them but okay discovered them and uh, thought, okay, could that be something that could help us, or was it, or basically, or opposite, is that something that just introduces more complexity yeah. into a world of uh, where we have enough before? So, of course, that's where we have said it's, a, but independent of microservices or not, we need to basically say get to separate this get this application divided into something that is more say, loose, cohesive f modules that are more loosely coupled than the data integrations we have today. Yeah. Um, and I think we have been touching on this, that, that you need skills to do this. So, um, and, and, and last year we were talking about how an enterprise like ours will attract uh, mediocrity. So uh, <laughs> the unfortunate thing is that we don't have too many people up here to, to, uh, to do this with. But I, I don't want to dwell too much on that, uh, just to, to say that that's part of the, the picture here. This is the, the um, uh, oh, I forget the name of uh, the Dreyfus model of, of uh, competence, yeah. Um, basically, step ladder. OK, uh, skip that one. So a bit on organization. I think that's an important thing. We, we already touched a little bit on it, but, but I think we, there are some, some, uh, some interesting things there. And we all know from, from everyone talking about these, these Amazon examples and everything, we should work in small teams, you know, two pizza teams. And as we, uh, uh, as we know, that, that's, a, that's a sort of the gold standard for organization, the, organize, organizing these, uh, these uh, new agile uh, teams we want to have. Um, and then, of course, you get uh, some people that uh, want to be the only person with two pizzas, but I mean, that's maybe, yeah. Um, anyone? No. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so th the basic thing, we, we already touched a little bit on that. I mean, uh, um, uh, someone here mentioned we basically have this small team that's been working over a long time, so basically why? Why didn't that work, right? So we, we touched on it a little bit, right? With the, with the maybe, you know, the, the fact that it is a small team over a long period of time actually cements everything because you don't get any new impulses in. They tend to solve the problems with the tools they have and all of this thing. Um, so I'm not sure, do you want to add some more? Anyone just want to add some more to that discussion or? No, I just more like if that was one of those say insights we maybe did is that okay small team is good but long time with no change is not is neither not good and uh, at least and I think that's one of those things that we are that 
if you think about uh, the agile movement and the things that it said, it's we talk all about small teams, but uh, we never talk about time. But you have. Yeah. You're, you're not going to intentionally replace people on a team just to get change, though, right? So no. there, there's other ways to introduce change. Yes. Yes, there is. But maybe you also should say that working more than, say, mer working, uh, say, 10 years, more than 10 years on one single system is not good, neither for the system well, nor for the employee. I'd say there's something else wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's uh, try and find out what. Uh, I, think, I think more so, it's not that you had a small team, it's that you chose to leave everyone in their place. You know, if you had rotated the five people around, you would not have this problem today. Uh -huh. If the guy who did all the database stuff had to go do the GUI stuff, and someone else did the database stuff, yeah, so multifunctional multi team, definitely this was not, right? And also I mentioned the, the database group that basically you can hand off part of the work to, right? So they are responsible for some of your custom code as well, and the, the putting it in production. So I, I need a little perspective here. You're, you're talking about that you currently have one or maybe now two small teams. Yeah. I mean, are we talking about for the whole company? When Jeff Be uh, Bezos was talking about that, Amazon has hundreds of small teams. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing a, yeah. almost a trillion dollar business that you're saying is governed by one or two small teams of four to six employees. Oh, yeah. I mean, no. It just seems like it hasn't worked out because you haven't invested. Okay, now, th this is for this application, right? This, okay. this particular right. and application. And that's what I'm trying to yeah. get yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and it's also worth saying that this, this, when you say this, this is basically those who do soft development the, the support organization on those on this particular product is close to 20. So uh, so so there's, there's more to it than uh, what we do. Yeah. So any, anyone want to venture some more into why this maybe is Maybe the back? team maybe the team member don't know object oriented development. At least uh, that's true for some of them, at least, yeah, for sure. Well, you say you have not succeeded, but it's not really clear to me in what sense you have not succeeded. Ah. I haven't seen any metrics, or I mean, you talk a bit about problems, and yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, fair, fair point. So, what are the metrics? I mean, the, the, like we mentioned in the beginning, that it takes very long time to add functionality, so, so time to market for new features is, is well, I'm not sure of the turnaround time anymore, but it's very hard to change anything, right? And then, especially talking about uh, those new functionalities that are more dynamic in nature, uh, when they start to challenge the data model, mm -hmm. then you get into real problems. Is it correct to say that during a while you were successful? Oh, yeah. But now the yeah, yeah. success is hard to step So as it, long as we yeah. do record keeping, we're fine, right? Yeah, I think that, of course, with respect to the system's usage and uh, say run from the functional side, it's been a success. That's the story of this system because why, why bother? Basically, you can buy such systems today from uh, at least a couple of vendors in the market and that's the preferred for, for the oil industry has been basically. So very few do this as custom systems, custom built systems. But, but they have seen that there have been, but what we see is that it's like pushing this big snowball up the mountainside. It's, it's get heavier and heavier, and uh, the process slows down, and we see that there is a lot of, say, external tracks that we need to... Uh, so, so is it still worth keeping the system alive, or should you be thinking about migrating to another commercial That's a good question, and... <laughs> I don't think we have the, the answer necessarily, but... I, it is an it's option. definitely an option, but then it comes to some of the... The uh, in say what I call corporate politics, put it that way. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so which, both on which the is user side and on the developer side, there are strong forces to keep it right and to uh, to, to expand the use of it. Uh, so you can't change because of the complexity of the system or the complexity yeah, of the data the, model. The data model mostly, yeah, because yeah, it's a long story, but yeah. So who's uh, managing or, or or providing direction to this team? <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> Most four years, it's been me. Yeah. And uh, basically, the first year I used, I think, to learn what this was all about. 
And uh, the, the other two years, I basically, okay, I tried to re say, okay, we, we cleared out, as you said, this should, should we buy, should we not? We did uh, buy. So basically, our unconventional operations within drilling here in the US is run on a commercial package from this fall. Works fine. But do that, talk about that, it's like uh, you get riots. <laughs> I think that, and, and of course, and then you're down to, the, all of course, into corporate culture. It's, it's all something about uh, people's ability to have influence, history, it, it's a long, long story. But so therefore we have, we have now said, okay, if we are going to keep it, we need to do something about it. It's no way to, to just continue as we have done. And that has, that has basically been uh, accepted, and also the team see, I think, much more the light that they are. They have seen some of the challenges, but so, you know, it's, I mean, it's really hard under this under that circumstance to kind of point the finger at the team and say yeah. it's the team. It's, I, say, of, I, say, I think that if if I'm honest, uh, even though on tape here, of course, it's been mismanaged for years. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, the, hard, that's, the, that's the that's the that's the that's the that's the fact, and I think that's. But I think also that's a fact in say many corporations like, where we just as an example that, the the leadership has no idea of what it means to own a software product, <laughs> and that it's something that it's like an, an it comes with an obligation, and uh, and you that you need to basically invest in, all the time. And uh, that has been missing. It's about using as little as possible. And uh, it's kind of the story yeah. you get once you once you've spent all your millions developing it, and now everyone thinks you're done, right? Mm -hmm. So and that was ten years ago. So then you were done, and of course the users have more requests, so you keep adding them, but it's still not considered active development. So you sort of bolt things on, and you create this monstrosity. I think I think that's somewhere close to the, the truth, and uh, and yeah, so so it's it's mismanagement for to 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 a large extent, of course. How do you troubleshoot this in the field? The cost of I mean supporting this must be exceptionally high, right? Well, well not, yeah, so technically it's not difficult, but what we saw is that when we we did some t testing related to the. Um, to the unconventional operations here in the US. And of course, introducing terminal server, deployed in Norway, developed in Norway, supported from Norway, even though we were able to build up some support say, capacity in Houston. Uh, of course, everything that was to blame, it be local problems, whatever, would have been pointed back to the software because they wanted the commercial software. And uh, I see now the, well, and then I got the commercial software, and uh, they have a particular up in uh, Dakota, Bakken area, where we have a huge operation. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Wild West, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, there is, of course, and I'm, I'm so gl I'm happy that I'm, we're not basically have to support them from, uh, from remote because uh, everything that doesn't work have been basically been blamed on the system from, for, say, uh, political reasons. Because that's usually a force for change if it's, you cannot troubleshoot in the field. And this is like a non-trivial activity, right? It's expensive yeah, activity. Yeah, extremely expensive. Yeah. And you have to have people, but, but even though as it is with the commercial product, they have people on rigs that do reporting because those guys who know how to run drill, they, they can't type on computers. <laughs> or not willing to type on computers, some of them. And some of them probably don't read and write either. So it's a <laughs> quite challenging uh, operations. Okay, final one on this. Uh, no, uh, in, in short, I mean, some parts of it we can tell, uh, especially some places where we are able to uh, already build some service interfaces around this thing. But for the most part, I mean, in the database particularly, it's very hard to see the impact. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think also that we, we need to say that we have a very good working relationship with, say, the product owner. But as you know, that the, 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 a product owner's most important word is no. You don't get this one. We have one who drives the... He's a very, I say, innovative guy. So he's the, he's the source of ideas. So, so we have to do okay. How to, but uh, we've got a good alliance with his, his boss. So she is tough, okay, and you have, you should, we need to ship something in September and anything that hinders that shipment goes out. <laughs> and that, that helps. Because uh, I think that's one of these yeah, things with custom built software that you easily, you, you want the cost of a package, but you want the flexibility of that you own it. So, okay, of course, I can add this and add that without necessarily thinking through if it's add real value. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left. I want to spend those 15 minutes on a different topic. Uh, so we skip some of these slides here um, and skip directly to this one, which is breaking the monolith. For those of you who don't know, this is a statue from Oslo, the Vigelonspaken. Uh, it's called the monolith, so it's appropriate. Anyway, we're not trying to break that one, though. Yeah. So. <laughs> how to eat an elephant. So, of course, uh, the famous is one bite at a time. Um, just to go quickly through the goals, again, we, we want to make it easier to implement new features. We want to make stored data more easily accessible, available to other applications. Uh, simplify the, the build and deployment routines and, and sort of also modern, modernize the technology stack. This is the, this is the why of so why we're trying to do this. And then what we want to try to do is go from this monolithic thing to something where we have the identified these bounded contexts. And here you see there is no duplication of experience. <laughs> um, so so to, to get to th this place where we can actually separate out these uh, these modules from the code and maybe do something with them individually. If we're, because these are ex bounded contexts existing within the, the monolith today, right? So, uh, and some of them are implemented well. Some of them are are, are not. Uh, I mean, well is a is a not a very precise word, but sort of I, what I'm talking about is to how to capture the dynamics within that particular bounded context, like like the project planner, for instance, which is basically today using the same data mechanisms as the daily reports. Because what are the daily reports? They are the, the actual of those project plans. So naturally, you will store the data in the same data structure, but the problems are two very different things when you try to do user interface on top of this, right? So, so that, that's a, just a good example of, of why this is problematic today. And so the question becomes, should you also then try and split out all of these things in the database? And I think part of the, the thing here that we want to focus on in the, in the last minutes is, is, can you even start to pick at this and, and how how do you do that? What are the techniques in, on the database side to to do this? Um, and so I, I'm not going to dwell too much on these things, but, it, but the, the point is that, and many people have said this before, right, try and, and make as small change as possible. And, and of course, there are some prerequisites to this, like we mentioned in the, in the, in the beginning, like you, you need some capabilities in your organization before you even start. I'm going to leave that because we've already been there. So uh, what we want to start with is to, to organize the code within our, our, uh, our monolith. If you are lucky enough to use an object-oriented language, which we are unfortunately not, use, use packages or namespaces to, to organize the code in, in sort of in your domain um, using the ubiquitous language we talked about, right? Get it organized there, and then you can start picking out the ones you want to move out. 
put stuff in production as early as possible, get feedback, all of this is important. Get it all the way through into production. This, we, we've been talking to some other companies in, in Norway that, that have tried as well these things, and this is very important. They say go into production with your smallest possible change, get the feedback, start, and, and then do another little change and make it into production and do it like that. But make make, make very, very, very small steps in this, uh, in this scenario. <laughs> so how do we, we extract the bounded context, right? Um, like I said, we have to identify why we want to do it. So in our case, this is the, the um, example of having a dynamic bounded context that we want to treat differently than, than the one we have today. So the project planner or the risk module or something like that, we want to to do it differently, both in terms of the, the, the model and the database. Um, and so there are different tactics you can use to, to uh, handle the database side. You can duplicate databases, which is quite common in this, uh, this area, replicate data between them, basically creating copies of, of things. Duplicate only the schema, so keep the same database instance but different schemas. Um, and you can sort of uh, put views on top, which is some, a technique that we've been using in this case, where we, if we want to have a service on top of the existing database, you put a view on top, uh, basically go through that, and then you can separate out the, the schema afterwards or, or do other uh, interesting things that way. So just to, to illustrate that, um, so basically we start out with this, this uh, service for, for the risk part, which we pulled out from here. Um, and in order to get started, just make a copy of the database, put some replication in place, and have the, the new model uh, write to that one, ba which basically changes nothing in the database side, but it's a start. Uh, and then the next step you can do after sort of having put this in production, like I say, small step, then you can start tweaking the model here. And then you have to maybe, not ideally, but you can make, um, this service write to both here and here and also pull data from here if you have to. I mean, this is potentially a dangerous thing, but it's a, it's a medium step. And the ideal situation you want to get to is something like this, where everything is encapsulated in a service and, and the service talks to the existing application, not the database. There's no connection down here. This is the picture you would like to have, very small step. Then we come to your uh, question about uh, NoSQL. Then you can do stuff like this. Then you can, if, if that makes sense for the service, then you can start. I mean, the first step is to, to make the model your own for, for the needs here. And if that involves changing the technology, also goes for, for this part. If you need to implement that in a functional language or whatever you might need, then you're much freer to do so. And one of the things we didn't talk about with the microservices is that the, the reason why you want them so small is that they should be replaceable quickly. So if you found out you made a mistake here or here, you could potentially switch it out. Um, now, I, I, th th this are, these are only uh, thoughts on, on, the, on the paper yet. So this is something that I really would like some feedback on in the last couple of minutes if you think this is uh, a good idea or, or, or not, and, and potential ways of improving uh, this way of doing it, if, if anyone has some experience with that. Yep. The one thing I, I'm still new to know as NoSQL databases, uh, it seems it is easier to store objects and the work, in other words, work with individual document independently, mm -hmm. but what are the limitations when it comes to reporting? Yeah, so uh, uh, some uh, NoSQL databases like MongoDB have good interfaces for reporting, so that's not an issue with that one. But So it depends on which ones you choose, right? If, the, if it's a document-oriented database, uh, it's typically harder than if it's a key value store. So, so but that's, uh, those are trade-offs. When you, when you select the, the, the technology down here, you, you have to basically look at what do you need and choose appropriately because sometimes you might need to have uh, 
many of these and, and, and distribute the database stuff across many services, maybe uh, uh, replicate between them, then there are some NoSQL databases that are better than that, for instance. But yeah. I just, just wanted to add that uh, we are, say, using uh, data warehouse technology for, say, the main aggregated type of reporting. So, of course, it's it's about also again use if that's a good idea or not. Uh, but at least that's at least they say own service that takes care of the kind of reporting you need instead of putting it into all these operational stuff. Yeah, yeah. So th that's all a very big part of this. W once you once you start thinking about having smaller components with more single purpose, you you also find that reporting is one such single purpose, or you can have many of those single purposes, and they can be their own thing, right? So you can do data warehouse if you need that. You can do simple reports tailored to sp <coughs> specific uses, and it doesn't have to come from this source anymore. It could be a, a, a specific reporting database that everyone uh, replicates into, or you know, whatever you, you might need. Sure. Now, with the document-driven database and municipal database, especially, the one downside is, unlike traditional databases, I cannot impose uh, structure, visibility. So when the uh, document definition changes, how does it affect future reporting capabilities? And then how do you ensure that multiple silos of developers or teams developing these data models have that bigger picture in mind? Yeah, how, how do you ensure a consistency across uh, the organization? I mean, a lot, lot of it is, is um, communication and, and uh, you know how how do you I mean we're talking when you're talking uh, more distributed services you're you're also talking about distributing responsibility in into the each of the teams um, so what you're left with is communication and coordination um, same thing when you build a large system with an agile method you tend to, to distribute the teams and then you coordinate by by uh, having the scrum of the member of the different scrum teams, things like that. So, so there are communication mechanisms built in this agile uh, processes to, to handle things like that. But <laughs> it's not a it's not an easy thing. So it's part of the cost of doing this type of architecture for sure. I think we are. The time is uh, yep. taking us. So if there are questions, it's fair to say we are here. And if somebody and if, okay experiences from others involved in dealing with monoliths are mostly welcomed. It, as well, you see, always welcome, always welcome yeah. because you see that it's, as we, we had some ideas, some of them we think are good, some maybe not that good. We have some history we need to take care of. And uh, so, yeah. And most of this is definitely uh, agreeable to discussion over uh, beer, so. I think your offer is fine, yes. Yeah, you can put it this way. If you buy a beer, you've got the entire <laughs> 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 that's the entire that's the way it works. Oh, okay. Thank you all for participating. Very good discussion. Thank you.